So Dr. Picardo, hello. Thank you so much for being here with us today. So our names are Stephanie and Kathleen. And as first year MA students in the LOE program, we're looking forward to learning more about you and your work. Again, on behalf of the research colloquium class, uh, we appreciate your time and interest to having this interview. Um, and getting acquainted with your research on plurilingualism, mediation, and uh, the Link Dyer Project, we're understanding that the overarching goal is to change the narrative on what it means to learn, understand, and use multiple languages. So we're really excited to be with you here today. Um, and our first question, I guess, is where did your passion for bringing plurilingualism into the K-12 education come from? Mm. Well, thank you for, first of all, thank you for coming here and uh, for interviewing me. I feel very, very happy to have this opportunity to exchange. Where did it come from? Well, I think it came from a personal experience, um, like from my life, uh, since I, I've always been passionate about languages. Uh, but the, the thing started maybe when I was... Uh, at the end of the elementary school, which is in at the age of 10, when you are in Italy, 10, 11, and we had to choose the language. And already at that time, there was this kind of push for English. Lots of my classmates uh, chose English, but my parents were kind of saying, no, 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 you should you should learn French because we lived 100 kilometers from the French border between Genoa and Nice. And uh, there was a little bit of a push from the family with the argument saying, well, you will have opportunities to learn English in your life, but French is the language of our neighbor. And we think it's a good thing if you start with that. So a bit reluctantly, I started, but then immediately I kind of so the reason I, I became passionate with this other language, we had opportunities to go to France so I could hear the, the music of the language as well. And, and, and it's true, I started like through that, I had other opportunities to learn English later. In a sense, I learned French at school and I learned English in a more natural context going to England and this was the very first start but then I studied a lot of um, ancient Greek and uh, Latin at school because I chose that type of secondary school where Latin modern languages were not there but it was uh, through the curriculum especially philosophy that I got uh, interested in German and so when I went to university I wanted to put them in the reverse order from the language I knew the least German as the first to the language I knew the most the French as the last and I had to fight against the um, the faculties because uh, at that time you were only allowed the two languages and so as a first year undergraduate I remember still having my mind this meeting with all the professors in, in their gown etc because it was a committee saying well, we think you did too much. You want to, you want, you have a, a plan of study which is way too ambitious. And in Italy, you could change it every year. You could so, slightly modify. And I said, well, if you oblige me to cut a language, that would be French. And that's very uh, such a pity because I already can function in French and. Uh, uh, give me at least the chance. And then I said, I still remember, well, I think you should be more worried about students who have a, a light or too light <laughs> um, plan of study than a too hard. <laughs> this was seen. They were like looking at me uh, saying, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and that that was it and uh, and I managed to have the three languages so there was this kind of building up you know seeing in a sense seeing that the more languages you learn and the easier it becomes it sounds like trivial like something we read in newspapers but there is there is true some truth in that because I also saw that my Latin and my ancient Greek and were of enormous help in learning German, for example, and in general, even now with the etymology, etc., you don't, you're not lost, you know. So it was a thing that built little by little, and then, of course, when I 
specialized to become a, a, a teacher first and then a, an academic. I, I went in, into more depth with the, with the concept and that's, that's how I appreciated it more. And being at OISI with so many other languages, students from who speak languages I had never been in contact with, was really another eye-opening um, uh, experience and it gave me so much more curiosity about uh, other languages. I've been here since 2009, so it really, it was really another learning curve that contributed a lot to my uh, interest in plurilingualism, pluriculturalism, everything related to multiple languages and cultures. Thank you so much. That's such a rich response. <laughs> Something I want to ask, because you did mention that you are an educator, you were trained as a teacher. So oftentimes as educators, we want to promote learner agency while ensuring that we still have complete control of the classroom. Yeah. And so how is complete control in conflict with learner agency? And how does the action oriented approach of plurilingualism help intervene with that? Yeah. That's a wonderful question, because I think this is one of the core problems. We have, in a sense, always been kind of educated as teacher to this idea of control. It's uh, If you look in the, the programs, sometimes more explicitly, sometimes more implicitly, but there is always this idea that you have to be a bit like the the maestro for an orchestra, you know, the director of an orchestra who's really in control and knows exactly what each uh, musician will be playing at what time and, and has, uh, but it's a bit different to be a teacher. It's, um, you don't have uh, um, people who are already like musicians, specialists of something. You have uh, people who are learning, are building their, their learning, and they are very different. So I think that this idea of having control is uh, not only wrong, but it's a, something that is not real. It's a kind of... Uh, uh, fairy tale that we tell ourselves, but um, even if a teacher can never have complete control. So we are at a point where this entire view should be really uh, completely problematized because they are at odds. Um, that doesn't mean that you, that is a, a laissez-faire thing. Everybody can do whatever they want. Uh, no, there is this agency in a well-constructed and well-planned uh, um, learning path, uh, let's say, learning uh, environment. Um, the idea that is typical of the action-oriented approach that is a core point of having scenarios is precisely for that. You do not control the minute by minute learning, but you do have the big picture and you communicate that big picture so that it's like giving a map to the students of what are you expecting them to do in order to be successful to do the final culminating task, which is the core of the scenario. And to do that, you work step by step in a kind of a mini scenario, which means that every time they have their agency and they are they have this responsibility of making choice, uh, collaborating with others, being also somehow responsible for for themselves, but also for what the others do, because at the end they have to produce, it's not a very nice word, but they have to come up with something. And, um, and this, is, this is part of the process of learning. So the teacher becomes in this, um, in this respect, a more um, uh, a resource, a more um, somebody who knows their students, knows their strengths and weaknesses, and is there to guide them to help them if necessary to guide is the person you go to um, and it's also the person you are responsible to you have to say hey i'm doing this because 
I've learned that in this way, I have this difficulty because, so it's not losing control in a, in a you, you get another type of control, which is probably control is probably not the, the right word at that point. It's a kind of more bigger vision that allows this agency. And another thing I want to say about the agency is that we can't take it for granted. Like, of course we do have agency, but depending on how we have been brought up, what is our culture of origin, uh, et cetera, we tend to use more or less of that agency or even be more or less aware that we have some agency. So, it sounds contradictory, but agency needs to be also nurtured in the class by the teacher. If you want the student to be willing and able to exert their agency, it's a bit like autonomy when it was the time that we talked a lot about autonomy. You don't um, imagine that people are autonomous just like that. You have to give them opportunities to improve their autonomy. The same thing is with agency. If you give them uh, structured exercises all the time, uh, yeah, you probably are in that control that you were mentioning before, but where is the agency? You just have to fill in blanks. And that's not agency. The other side of the, the medal uh, is that you regain control by in a, in a positive way by entering uh, by by inserting phases of reflection because some people think that the action oriented approach is like you learn kind of almost organically like you, you develop etc and so it's absolutely against any grammar or work on vocabulary no it is not it's only that you you reverse the perspective you don't learn the grammar in order to do something. You do something, you see what you need, and then you reflect in order to, to improve and your accuracy, to make, uh, to learn more. You go in a moment, you start with a moment of fluency, and then you work on your accuracy, because otherwise you never proceed to move up in the proficiency, you know, you need, we know that proficiency at higher levels implies also being precise, uh, having a rich vocabulary, etc. So if it's always everything goes, you will not improve your vocabulary. But it's not done in advance, it's done afterwards in a form of reflection, shared reflection and, and systematization, let's say. That is such an interesting response because I don't think I was expecting that, actually. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Using uh, what you just said, um, I'd like to move on to the Link Dyer project mm -hmm. that you've had. The Link Dyer project is based on a model within the Council of Europe, and it uses a lot of the CEFR very extensively. And the CEFR has been criticized by many educators in Canada um, to be very European focused and not in line with the decolonization agenda that many of the educators now have, especially after the pandemic. So can you speak more about how this framework can apply to a Canadian context and how it would still be relevant? If yeah. It is? Are you ready to stay here until tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, let's start with demystifying one thing. Um, the first, the first the precision and then some demystification. The precision is that the LinkedIn project is not based on a model. It only uses uh, some, uses the descriptors that have been produced with the new CFR. I will tell you in a moment what, what is the, it is. Um, but it's sure that is it's based on four pillars of the LinkedIn pro project, the plurilingualism, the action oriented approach, the use of technology and precisely reflection accompanied by or guided 
that we did together with indigenous colleagues. So it's that's our fourth pillar, the idea of a holistic learning and reflection. So that's the model of the LinkedIn project. So as you can see, the CFR is used as it should be, as a tool to help teachers give a name to what they see done and help them plan, have objectives, plan their courses and link learning assessment and self-assessment since the beginning in a nice circle, like in an effective circle. So that's about the project. About the second part of the question on the CFR. I know this E of the CFR has always been kind of difficult to digest for certain uh, educators, but about this, we needed to say two things. First of all, the E stands there because the CFR has been produced by the Council of Europe, which I want to say because in many, in, in several even scholarly articles, they mix, they have a, a confusion between the Council of Europe and the European Union. They are two separate institutions and the Council of Europe includes many more countries than the European Union. Has not The main focus is the protection of human rights and the most important action of the Council of Europe, our body is the European Courts of Human Rights where citizens can go if they think that their rights have not been defended in their country. So it's a totally different idea than the European Union, which started as an economic uh, a cooperation institution and then expanded. So already this says a lot because the CFR was born in that idea of providing a tool that can help bring clarity and coherence in teaching, learning and assessment, which until that time had not gone together like assessment was always seen as an extra thing that arrives, you have to do, or vice versa, the driving force of the learning. So the idea that uh, you have a series of descriptors that describe, and they are illustrative descriptors, meaning this is not a sacred book, is example, these descriptors are validated and calibrated with a lot of uh, teachers around the world and not just European to say, yes, this is what reasonably can be done at this level of proficiency. And the fact of seeing this can do statement, which are all based in a positive way, should help teachers plan and should help the, the students say, oh, okay, I can do that. I can do provided somebody helps me. So it's all in this respect, but because what you say is true that there, are, there have been attacks against the CFR. In my personal opinion, there has been a, a problem at the beginning, since the beginning that the CFR has been overused by assessment bodies uh, and those who provide the test. So because they had the possibility of spreading the news and they gave often a very a small vision of the CFR partial uh, idea, then the teachers thought, okay, that's an assessment tool period. So it's more than that, it's way more than that. It's the, it's the pedagogical part is huge. So there's been a new project that has given, has ended with a new version of the CFR published in 2020, which is called the CFR Companion Volume, but it's not a guide, it's not an accompanying book, is the new version of the CFR with all the descriptors of the previous one, previous edition, plus a lot of description, descriptors for mediation, all forms of mediation and plurilingualism and new scales for phonology, et cetera, sign language, and a short, easy part on what are the concepts. So this addresses the idea of the colonial, anti-colonial view, because we have all, also worked in that uh, perspective totally. The idea is precisely to, to break down 
those that view of language as uh, an imposition of uh, or running through activities so to to be successful in a test you know without any consideration uh, for the culture behind, for uh, the differences of different languages, for the mediation process that is always there. And so with the new edition, this is particularly strong. The idea that, um, that we mediate all the time. We mediate when we communicate with others. We mediate when we read or produce texts or we listen. We mediate when um, we try and understand or create concepts together. Like in your class, when you are studying, reading an article, you're mediating. You're mediating for yourself. You're mediating with the others if you work together. If you have a to report, you're mediating again. And in this mediation process, all your knowledge, all your cultures are there, your repertoire. And so I don't see how this can be accused of any, um, of being at odd with a, an anti-colonial perspective. There's a bit this misunderstanding that everything that comes from Europe must be by by definition colonial but luckily this is not always the case and this is one example where it definitely isn't and the reason really to address this idea of um, these uh, accusations let's say or this misunderstanding I would say more uh, it the the new CFR uh, was born, and um, and I invite you to have a look at that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's very user friendly, which the other wasn't. The other was uh, a bit tough to read, uh, especially to to discover alone and by by yourself. But the new one is very user friendly. Thank you so much. It's interesting, really, and thank you so much for the insight, especially on these institutions where we as students don't normally get to see, like we, we don't normally get to see how they operate maybe on a global scale. So mm. it's interesting really to get this insight. Um, we wanna move on to maybe a question more so on terminology. Um, so in today's literature on pedagogy, we often see the word or the prefix trans mm -hmm. come up as um, a commonly used part of the term such as transcultural pedagogy that um, is used in Western Canada, we just saw in another colloquium um, by Rat Zaidi. Um, so yeah, we wonder what would you consider to be the key difference between trans and pluri in pedagogy? Okay. Um, well, first of all, let me say that we all work uh, for the same scope to break a mono vision, uh, monocultural, monolingual. So that's very important to keep in mind. It's not, uh, I've always thought that it's not a fight. It's, um, and should never be. Although in academia, very often there is this kind of uh, sloganization as uh, a colleague aptly wrote uh, in the title of her book. Um, so I think that I've always considered that the trans prefix, let's take a plurilingualism and trans translanguaging, no? Translanguaging being part, being one of the plurilingual pedagogies and being one of one way of putting plurilingualism, which is more of a concept of a theory into practice. Uh, not the only one, but certainly a very important one. And it has definitely helped break um, some visions. On the cultural aspect, it's more a constellation. Like even in, even in Europe precisely, there is still a kind of tension between intercultural and pluricultural. So people are using these prefixes uh, Sometimes uh, they use one, they don't use the other. It's like with the transcultural and pluricultural, some people prefer one to the other. It's again, um, in a sense, the word 
is a word. It's not, it's not more than that. What is interesting is the vision behind, the vision that we should not consider cultures already as uh, uh, closed entities, straight jackets, uh, where, and also labels too much, but seeing, seeing the fluid nature of culture and the possibility of breaking barriers, of going beyond, of using multiple uh, cultures, like we use multiple languages, and, and also considering that, like in languages in plurilingualism, we always say that the, you're not a polyglot, you, you're not expected to know all the languages at the same level, but even a, even a tiny knowledge of a language has a role to play when you when you think of your repertoire. The same is with cultures. I mean, it, there is this idea of um, of um, considering discovering cultures, being between cultures, having having this open view of what cultures really bring. I think it's very, very important because, again, I definitely prefer that we talk about transcultural and pluricultural than multicultural. What I, I have more problems with the multi, like with the multilingualism, with the multiculturalism, because the multiculturalism is very often what we see in Toronto, different neighbors, little Little Italy, Chinatown, Korean town, little enclave where people live in a in a in a bubble in a sense, and they don't necessarily know about the others. They're not necessarily interested to know, or worse, there is this reduction of a culture to like a food and um, trivial aspects. I don't mean food is an important thing, of <laughs> course, and the cuisine is part of a culture, but it's not the only one, you know, and sometimes uh, you think that this is what it is reduced to. So the multi, and I've written in my articles, gives to me the sense of separate, list of separate things, whereas the prefix plu pluri and the prefix trans gives immediately the idea of fluidity or breaking or going beyond, which is what we need. We need that enormously. For the pedagogy of the language, we need to break, to have the students really understand that they have other languages, they can use those languages. These languages are important. There is not a first class, second class language. There are no dialects as, as important as languages. In our, uh, in my last, um, in my research that was kind of the continuation of the LinkedIn, we had students who really had epiphanies, like they had kind of always kept hidden the languages, but especially the dialects, because they've always thought that dialects don't have any space, any place in, in school. They are really kind of second category. And then all of a sudden they discover and they become proud. We had the kids from the very north of, your, of Italy where they speak uh, uh, quite a lot of dialects still, but the older generation who came to school and said, oh, my grandparent continue with this dialect. I don't understand why this is really annoying, why they can't speak Italian. At the end of the, the research, they said, well, I understand my grandfather. I can't really reply apart from some words, but I do, that's the dialect. I was like, wow, the teachers were um, really amazed. And the same happened with uh, languages of origin or kids from the immigration that had kind of hidden their language before. And then they, they, they wanted, they gave space. So they started to tell in, for example, the other kids, you see in Brazilian Portuguese, we say that and we write and they were in a class of English, uh, foreign language. So 
they didn't study Portuguese and nobody understood Portuguese in the class, but the, the kid became the mediator of her culture and her language with the class. And so did the others with the dialect. And this that's where I think those prefaces help us conceptualize this movement, which is so needed, so much needed. Thank you so much for that. We still have some time, so we're going to have our last couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, this one being about writing and about your writing style. Your writing style, I think when I was working through the articles that we'd selected, um, I would say that it was one that resonated really well with me. Your work is written in a way that I find is very easy to understand. And um, I'm wondering how does your linguistic repertoire inform your communicative skills, um, especially when academia is so filled with jargon. Do you have any writing style tips and what is that process like for you? Okay, the tip is be yourself. Uh, <laughs> like don't, don't think that because you are in academia, you have absolutely to follow all the rules. You have to follow a little bit the rules for sure, but also be a bit of a rebel, rebel, like try and break or bend the rules when when you can. Like don't give up on your nature and style just because others write in other ways. I'm saying this now, um, but it has not been an easy process because um, I was born in Italy, studied in Italy, then I, I was a professor in France and I had to completely adapt to the French academia style and then came to North America and it's a totally different third way of doing and, um, and that was a, a challenge. Um, I must be very honest, like one of the main challenges uh, that I still struggle with is that very often articles here are written in a way that they tell you the entire story in the first half page and then and they you know already and then they go with the explanation and there is a conclusion with let me let me tell you very often a very boring repetitive explanation and it's a totally different style from what I was used to, where you, little by little, you take your reader through a reasoning process until you later in the article, you tell them, well, this is, this is what I wanted to tell you. See, it makes sense because I explained you this and that and that and that. So I was, <laughs> it was really a struggle with that and um, and still I have to force myself to write in that way if I have to write in an article for example that um, that is uh, where it's almost uh, almost required because if you want to be uh, uh, then accepted by the reviewer you have to follow certain rules um, but at the same time, as I said, you can slightly bend the uh, the rules and take little little by little, have your agency enter into that. So I think this is also important. And I think this is part of practice what you, you preach. If we talk about the pluriculturalism, transculturalism, well, we needed to practice that because if we forget all our cultures and writing styles because the Anglosphere writes in a certain way, well, then we don't practice what we preach. I'm sorry. It's just uh, that we say we write about that, but we do everything not only in English, but also with the, with the English style, like the Anglophone style. And I think it's a big loss, a cultural loss that we have. And we should slightly shift academia, not only to insert more publications into other languages, uh, because it's a real, real problem. Too many publications are in English um, and it's kind of machine that uh, works by itself now. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's very, uh, it's problematic. So write also in other languages, read also in other languages, and don't forget your 
culture, your style of writing, your rhetorical, because every language and culture has their own rhetorical style. You're not, the kids who are brought to literacy in different languages are often later, once they overcome the initial part, they are taught in a slightly different way how to write. And, and that's that's difficult, but it, it's a beauty. Again, it's this multicolored view that like a, a water painting of colors that go into each other, you know, not separate. Dr. Picardo, I could hear you talk for hours. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, your advice is so good. Yeah. So we have to start wrapping up, unfortunately. I wish I could stay here for hours, but I'm going to ask you one last question. Where do you see yourself moving in the ever-evolving field of plurilingualism? Um, well, I think that uh, we have... Uh, started to break just the crust of the problem. So I think there is a lot to do because these good moments where people like teachers see the value of multiple languages, of opening up the class, of breaking the classroom wall exist. But first of all, not every teacher has had the chance to experience them because as I said very often well teacher education is still done in silos languages are um, the language teacher is trained only to teach that language and um, but things are moving even we see other colleagues in in this house are, are also going in the same direction so things are moving but there is there's still quite a lot to do so I see myself continuing in this I wouldn't call it a mission but almost you know, like trying to try to break these barriers at the same time I've started Last year, teaching a course on complexity theories in language education, which I will be teaching in the fall again, because I think here we are faced with something bigger than just the languages or the cultures. We need to have this kind of broad and more holistic and more fluid vision of everything we are uh, we are experiencing as human being and the school needs really to break even more barriers uh, across disciplines uh, and in the way students are educated. So I think that through, for me, I can contribute from the language point of view, but I think that we should really join more forces to work together. And then another thing I see myself in is really to help demystify certain um, things that have been misunderstood about the CFR, about plurilingualism. We have now a new um, uh, edited series with Rutledge, Rutledge Studies in Plurilingualism, uh, which also aims to continue the, the work. And um, yeah, there is a problem in academia that when somebody gives um, a missing interpretation of something and they write it, uh, it's automatically kind of cited. And because we unfortunately work with uh, quantitative numbers of citation, this becomes, becomes a truth, which is something that we see in, um, unfortunately, also in journalism, when somebody says something and it's, in, uh, and it's uh, repeated enough times, it tends to become a truth and nobody questions it. So this is something I see myself um, uh, acting upon uh in the future and and above all helping the new generation to to go in that direction like you like see break barriers i've seen we have a book now that is under review uh written with a lot of my former um students uh, we try and reflect really on 
what it means breaking those barriers and through their voices, this is clearer. <laughs> and I hope it will be clearer to the readers. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Dr. Picardo. We really appreciate your time that you've given us today. And we hope you have a good day. Thank you very much for these questions. They were wonderful, <laughs> like very, uh, very uh, to the point, really, <laughs> something very important. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for so your much. work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.